I think we are live right now. So um, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, everyone. Uh, I'm very delighted to have uh, Dr. Alpa uh, Cervera Lerta here with us today at Hepatia uh, series uh, for a great talk, actually. Uh, the talk is going to be about uh, a noisy intermediate scale uh, quantum algorithms. Uh, it's a very hot topic and uh, we believe that uh, we will uh, benefit a lot uh, from it. Uh, before further ado, I do believe that uh, Professor Yunus would like to say a few words first and then the floor is, uh, is all yours. Uh, I think the, the mic will be, will be uh, uh, Alba's, uh, not the floor, until we meet in, in a conference or something. Uh, Dr. Alba, uh, how are you? Uh, we are really glad to have you in, in Hepatia Quantum Series in Alexandria Quantum Computing Group. Uh, and we are looking forward for your talk. Uh, many people are interested in this era in uh, quantum algorithms. And I, 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 I am sure they will find your talk very interesting and very uh, informative. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Junes. And uh, thanks, Karim, for the nice introduction. Uh, okay, I will share my screen. Um, yeah, I'm very glad to be here. I hope that I can visit Alexandria at some point in the future physically. <laughs> Let's and see we, if it we works. Invite you officially <laughs> I, to will, visit I will love to visit Egypt, really. So, so I, I, I know that uh, the audience is, uh, is broad, so there are some people that have some background in physics, maybe high school students as well, they told me. Uh, so my talk may be a little bit technical for some of you, so please don't hesitate to ask me any question in the chat and and please interrupt me if necessary if I need to clarify some concepts so everybody can more or less follow the talk because the idea is I just want to present this super big field. I, I have no time to enter into into much details, of course, but just to give you an idea of why are people working in this particular field and why is important or interesting in my opinion, of course. Uh, so yeah, do not hesitate to stop me at any point. OK, so today I will present uh, noise intermediate scale quantum algorithms. This is just one of the subfields of quantum computing, which in turn is one of the subfields of quantum technologies. So quantum technologies is a big field which comes from a mixture between quantum mechanics and classical information theory. So these two fields mixed in the 80s or 70s, 80s, and quantum information arise. So it's another way to study uh, quantum mechanics from an uh, information point of view. So at the beginning of the 80s or so, and the problem was that many people started to realize that we can that simulating quantum mechanics, which is in the end the theory that affects the atoms, the small scale uh, physics, the high energy physics, etc. Uh, this theory, uh, it was extremely difficult to simulate with classical uh, computers because it requires a lot of computational time the, to simulate these systems. Uh, you need huge amount of memory. So that's why some physicists started to think about why we should use uh, classical computers to simulate quantum mechanics instead of building a computer that also obeys the laws of quantum mechanics, so a quantum computer. So that was the idea, but the problem is that the technology was not good enough, of course, at that time to start uh, thinking that that could be a reality at some point. Uh, so then in the 90s, some people like Peter Short, who developed the, the, the factorization algorithm, or Seth Lloyd, who also proposed very interesting algorithms, uh, they found that we can all, all, also use the principles of quantum computers to solve problems in an exponentially faster way than with a classical uh, devices. So this is the example of the factorization algorithm. So factorizing two numbers, it's exponentially hard with a classical computer. But with a quantum computer that obeys these laws of quantum mechanics, we can do that in uh, exponentially faster. That means that if we have a quantum computer, all the cryptographic codes that we are using nowadays, they can be break. And of course, it's a security uh, issue. Uh, however, we are really far away from, from, from having a quantum computer of this size and this uh, and this quality to really break encryption. So don't worry anyone, but it's something to take, uh, to take in mind. So quantum computers can also be used for other things regarding also studying uh, the simulation and the physics, etc. 
So the so the these fields of quantum technologies in the at the beginning of the 2000s, people started to generate to 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 do the first experiments with the first quantum gates and the first quantum simulations. And now, of course, the field has increased exponentially because now the technology allow allow us to test all the theories and all the ideas that we had during the 80s, 90s, and 2000s. So that's why it's so trendy because companies realize that we can do something with it. So, so that's why there is a lot of money, and when there is a lot of money invested in science, cool things happen. And just to let you know, this is not the only field in quantum technologies. We also have quantum simulation, and we also have uh, a quantum communication and quantum metrology and sensing. So quantum computing is just one part of this field. So this is the broad introduction. So let me start with the outlook of my talk. Uh, I will start off why, what is quantum computing in this, in this era. And then I will uh, review what are the uh, variational quantum algorithms, which is a particular kind of algorithms that are considered NISC. Then I will summarize some ways that we have to squeeze the NISC lemon. So how can we obtain the best capabilities of our quantum devices? And then I will also present a few applications, only a few of them, there are many. And finally, I will conclude with some remarks of what is yet to come and what kind of things are coming in this field. So first of all, what is quantum computing in the NISC era? So this, this name NISC stands for Noisy Intermediate Scale Quantum, and it was coined by John Preskill in 2018, so it's very recent. And we recently published a review about it because this field has exploded to so fast that we consider that we should sit and put together all the applications and, uh, and, uh, and theory that we know so far about this, uh, these NISC algorithms. So I will mention later what why we call it NISC. Let me start with a little bit of introduction of what is the power of quantum computers. So as I said before, quantum computers can be used to simulate quantum physics, obviously, but it can also be used to solve problems faster or more efficient, efficiently than with a classical computer. And this is something that it was discovered, as I said, in the 90s with the short factorization algorithm and other algorithms came afterwards. So in, uh, from a quantum, from a um, complexity point of view, uh, we can classify the problems by how hard are they to solve it. So for instance, you may have heard that the solving uh, the, the chess problem is extremely difficult and nobody is able to do that. But for instance, the Go can be solved in a, with a powerful quantum, with a powerful, sorry, uh, classical computer. So in the end, we can classify problems of how hard are they and how much time we need how many operations we need to solve them. And because of that, we can classify them in different complexity classes, where the P class is those uh, those algorithms that can be solved efficiently with a normal computer, with a classical computer. So these are the easy ones. So we don't need a quantum computer for that, and we probably don't need even a supercomputer for that. But then there are some algorithms that are NP, which means that once you have the solution, it's easy to test. But if you don't have the solution, it's extremely complicated to find. For instance, the factorization algorithm. So factorization algorithm, it's really difficult to factorize two large, two large numbers. But if I gave you two factors, you can easily multiply them and check if they uh, provide the final factor. So this is uh, the idea of NP class. And there are much different classes, and it's a huge zoo of, of, of complexity classes. And the idea is that quantum computing uh, and quantum mechanics introduces new rules, which means that some of these classes uh, may be efficient for a quantum computer, but not for a classical computer. So in the end, what we have to focus here is which problems are in the big Coupe class, which is the, uh, those algorithms that can be solved efficiently with a, with a quantum computer, but not with a classical computer, or maybe some of them not with a classical computer. Or even those algorithms that are extremely hard to be solved, the ones in NP, maybe are uh, to find some of some approximate solutions may be easier with a quantum computer but we don't know we just have to explore this so this is one of the open problems of what are the limits of quantum computing so as i said before this field is extremely trendy and as an example let me show you this graph of uh, of this paper uh, which was about predicting these research trends studying all possible uh, 
uh, papers that has been published in, in different journals. And the most emerging term was the qubit. And it, the, first, uh, the first mention to a qubit is from April 95 in this paper, in quantum coding. Although before people were, were talking about two-dimensional systems or, or quantum bit instead of qubit, etc. Qubit is the generalization of a classical bit. So if a classical bit, we can have a zero and a one. With qubit, we can we can have the zero state, the one state, or a superposition of them, which is a quantum mechanical property. We can have superposition of uh, a mixture of states, and because of that, we can have also entanglement and other properties. So in the end, this uh, the, I, I made this graph many years ago in 2018, so it's not updated. But uh, as I said, in 2007 or so, the the wave company uh, started to say to sell quantum computers. There were quantum annealers, so it's not the same as current quantum computers. It's another technology, but still, people started to realize that we can make these devices. So uh, many companies started to invest on it. So and after that, it's a it's a complete race of who has the first quantum computer and who has the first uh, uh, application of quantum computing. And, uh, and as, as you have probably heard, we have two quantum advantage experiments. The first using superconducting processor in, uh, by Google in 2019, and the second by the, the group of, of Chao Yan Lu and Zhao Yue Pan in China with photons. So it's a different technology in 2020. And that means that they, uh, they were able to solve a problem with their quantum computers that will require in some cases, millions of years, although the, the claim was reduced to only a few hours or weeks to solve with a classic with a classical supercomputer. So the best supercomputer will require maybe weeks to solve that problem, while with these quantum computers, you can solve it in minutes or maybe seconds. So even though this is uh, none of these uh, problems or none of these experiments show um, an application, they just show that the technology is ready to explore applications that cannot be reached by classical computers. And as I said before, this is only quantum computing. In quantum simulation, we have huge advances as well, and also metrology and, com and communication, but I'm not an expert in those fields and I don't have time to mention this. Just keep that in mind. There are many ways of, uh, of building a quantum computer, and it depends on the technology that you want to use. Uh, I will focus on the what is called gate-based quantum computing. That means that it's just the analogy of classical computation. So instead of classical gates, logic gates, we have quantum gates, and instead of uh, bits, we have qubits. But there are other ways to do quantum computing. Also keep that in mind. We mentioned that in the in the review as well. So these qubits, as I said, from a more mathematical point of view, are two-dimensional vectors and diagrammatically are represented by lines and experimentally are any quantum system that can control two levels. For instance, the polarization of a photon left and right, superconducting circuits using different uh, energies of the of the Joseph Salk junction that constructs them or trapped ions, which uses the ground state of, uh, of our uh, ion or an excited state of that ion. So in the sense, where are the electrons located, let's say, uh, with respect to the nucleus. Then we have the gates, which are the interaction between the, these qubits, and they are represented by uh, SU to the power of n matrices, where n are the number of qubits. So if we have two qubits, SU, SU4, so it's a four times four matrix. If we have three qubits, it will be SU8, so we will have eight times eight matrices, and so on and so forth. And you can st uh, start realizing how complicated that will be if we have, for instance, 30 qubits. We will need to simulate that with a classical computer to the power of 30 uh, dimensional matrices. So that's extremely expensive from a memory point of view. And that's why in the end we will need a quantum computer to simulate a quantum computer. And these are represented by uh, boxes. So for instance, the one in this example is called the Hadamard gate, and it's this box with an edge inside of it. And experimentally are laser pulses or optical devices that parametric down conversions or microwave pulses, depending on the technology. And finally, once we construct our circuit, we have to measure it. That means project uh, into one of the computational basis states. So we just open the box and see if it's a zero or it's a one. And depending on the result, we then post-process the result and obtain some predictions about the, our problem. And this is done by coupling with a cavity or photon detectors, as again, depending on the technology. 
So just to mention how difficult it is uh, from an experimental point of view to build these quantum computers. Uh, this is the example, in case that you never uh, you never seen it, the integer factorization algorithm, the famous algorithm that can break encryption with a quantum computer. So the, the original one, I mean, the one that you can see in Wikipedia and in some textbooks is the one in the top left. Uh, and as you see, it's okay, it, does, it doesn't seem so complicated, but when we check how to really uh, perform this UA to the power two matrices, we need a lot of qubits, a lot of them, and a lot of physical operations. So it becomes more and more and more complicated if we have a, a quantum circuit that is uh, the theoretical, let's say, and we have to reduce it to the basic gates that are uh, that can be implemented in a real experiment. So one thing is talking about the theory and another very different thing is talking about the experiment. And as example, I, I run this uh, this um, this experiment two, three years ago in March or May of 2018. It was a very simple one, apparently. So it's just it just required a few uh, number of quantum gates and it's only four qubits. So it's something that can be simulated with a classical computer. It was just a proof of concept. But as you can see, even if there were a few gates and technically these gates were good enough to perform the operations, something is going on and the results doesn't match the, the theory, doesn't match the simulation. And the problem is that here there are many sources of error. So it's time that we apply a quantum gate this gate is not perfect, it has some noise, it has some errors, and that's why the results are not the ones that we expect with our perfect and ideal um, theory. So this is something that uh, we have to take into account, all the errors that comes from readouts, so maybe we are not reading the qubits correctly, cross talk between qubits, so it's time that I apply an operation, it also affects other qubits, or just that the qubits that cohere, that means that they lose the quantum mechanical properties, so all the algorithm is lost. So many things can happen, and that's what is happening right now in our field. So here's when we arrive to this noise intermediate scale quantum. So as I said, uh, quantum computing is very hard experimentally because on one side, qubits have to interact strongly using these quantum gates, but not with the environment. So we want them to interact, but only the ones that we want, not the ones that we don't want. So if I want to perform an operation between qubit one and two, I don't want that this qubit two also interacts at the, at the same time with another one, of course. And except if we want to measure them, because when we measure them, we have to interact with all of them and see what are their quantum state. So in the end, what is the state of the art in digital quantum computing, which is this gate-based quantum computing? We have 50 qubit devices, the order of 50, some have 72, so it's a kind of brace as you maybe have heard from news. Uh, and the error rates of these gates are 10 to the power of minus three, which means that they are not good enough to implement what is called as quantum error correction. So quantum error correction are a series of, of protocols that allow you to correct the qubits on the fly. So if they are not perfect, uh, compensating these imperfections with other qubits. And this is extremely difficult because that means that you need many qubits to codify the quantum information in only one, which is called logical qubit. So that means that for having quantum error correction, you need millions of qubits. And we are far away for that because we only have the order of 50 right now. So that means that we are in what is called noisy intermediate scale quantum. Noisy because the qubits are not perfect, they are affected by noise. Intermediate scale because we only have 50 qubits or the other of 50, although intermediate scale is considered up to 100 qubits at least. And uh, that means that we also need low error rates because if the error rates are so high, it, everything can be simulated classically with clever methods. But we don't have quantum error correction, so we don't have enough good and we don't have enough qubits to implement quantum error correction. And the question is, what can we do at this near term? So the point is it's a good trial to study physics. Just the process of building these devices is interesting from a physical point of view, because it's not clear which technology should we use. Should we use superconducting circuits? Should we use ions? Should we use photons? It's not clear. All of them have pros and cons. And what are the possible applications? We don't know. We have we suspect some of them. We have some algorithms as I will present later, but it's not even clear if they are a clear application or maybe not. Maybe we'll need much more qubits to achieve any real application. And in any case, it's a step towards default tolerant quantum computation, which is 
the future when we can implement quantum error correction so we can run all possible algorithms. So give me a second. So with that, I, <clears throat> I will start summarizing what is this variational quantum algorithms, which is one of the approaches for NISC algorithms. There are many NISC, so anything that can be run in a near-term quantum computer is a NISC algorithm. But these variational quantum algorithms were precisely designed and they were inspired by these limitations that impose the NISC uh, computation. So the parents of these variational quantum algorithms are the variational quantum eigensolver and the quantum approximate optimization algorithm. But after these ones, there are many, many more. So what is a variational algorithm? The idea is using the variational principle of physics to uh, iterate until we converge towards some, uh, towards some solution. So we start with some initial state, uh, which could be the state of all qubits in the zero, 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 zero. Then we apply some quantum circuit, but this quantum circuit will depend on a series of parameters. I call these parameters theta. So once we once we run this circuit, we measure and we have some output state. And of course, we want that this output state is the solution of our problem. So how can we know that? Uh, in general, in quantum computing, what we can measure are not the states, but the expectation value of some operator. This operator, which can be a Hamiltonian, what has it, it encodes the information of our physical problem. For instance, we can have a molecule. We can encode this molecule in, into a Hamiltonian, compute this expectation value with our quantum computer, and our goal is to obtain what is the minimal energy of this uh, of this Hamiltonian, which means what is the minimal expectation value, because this energy is sorry. OK, because this energy is related with the with the activation energy of our molecule, so we can use this information to design new materials to design to discover new reactions, etc. This is just one example. So once we have this expectation value, this is some number, so it's not quantum, it's, we just have a number. We put this number into some classical minimization, like gradient descent or, or any other minimization method, and this minimization method would suggest a new set of these parameters. So in the end, we repeat the process over and over, and the idea is that this classical minimizer, which is the red box here, is fine-tuning the parameters of our quantum system. So we can achieve this minimal solution. So we repeat the process over and over until we converge to some approximation of the ground state energy, which is the solution of our problem in this case. And as I said, this box is the parameterized quantum circuit, so we need to design it. And this, uh, the bottom part is the classical optimization. And that's why these variational algorithms are also called uh, hybrid quantum classical algorithms, because they mix the both worlds. They mix the quantum computing, the quantum world by computing the expectation value of this operator, and they are, they mix it with the classical world by uh, optimiz optimizing all over this set of parameters. So first of all, uh, maybe I will pass this very quickly. We have to design the objective function. As I said before, this is ob this objective function is. Uh, could be just the ground state of our, uh, sorry, just the Hamiltonian, the expectation value of our Hamiltonian, but it can be any other things. It can be, we can try to codify any physical problem into this Hamiltonian. We can have a superposition of Hamiltonians. We can have the fidelity, which is the, which is the distance between our quantum state generated by the circuit and our goal, our final solution state. So we can do many things here. The point is we need to decompose whatever we use as objective function into what is called Pauli strings, because Pauli strings are the smaller quantum operators and are the ones that we can measure in our quantum computer. So you, can, you can't uh, measure whatever you want in the quantum computer. It has to be decomposed into some operators that you know how, how they work, and in this case are called Pauli strings. So in the end, whatever you have, you have to decompose it into Pauli strings, and then you can compute this expectation value with your quantum computer. Then the, the other box that I said before is the parameterized quantum circuit, the black box that you have to fine tune and find the parameters. And for that, you need to design it. How, how can we design it? Should we use single qubit gates? Which entangling gates should we use? Should we connect this qubit one with qubit three? There are many possibilities, of course. 
So the idea is to uh, to design uh, this quantum circuit by uh, studying the physics of our problem, for instance, with the problem inspired ansatz. And a good example of this one is the unitary coupled cluster, which is using chemistry. So because we know how is our molecule modulated, we can guess what will be the best quantum circuit that will prepare the ground state. Or if that's super expensive sometimes because it requires many gates, we can also think about hardware efficient answers. So we just decompose our quantum circuit into layers, like I will apply single qubit gates and then entangling gates and so on and so forth. And at some point, uh, we expect that by repeating these answers multiple times, we can map all the Hilbert space, all, this, all the space of these parameters, and just find the solution anyway. So maybe it will require more, more parameters at the beginning, but it's easy to prepare because we know how to entangle these two gates, for instance. Sorry, these two qubits. And finally, we need the classical optimization. As I said, this classical optimization is a classical subroutine, so there is no quantum computing here. Only the grade, if we use a gradient descent method, the gradients have to be obtained with our quantum computer, but there are many ways to do that, so it's not a problem. Although it may require more measurements and it can extend the computational time, the total computational time. But the idea is if you know, if you are an expert in uh, classical optimization methods in general, in anything, in machine learning, in, in uh, data fitting, whatever, you can use this knowledge to adapt it to, a quantum to quantum computing algorithms, because the quantum computing algorithms like this one also requires by these methods. So with that, let me move to the squeezing the Nils lemon, which is, uh, okay, this is very nice, but this, all of this is theory. What happens when we move to the experiment? What are the things that will arise and how can we solve them? And as I said before, it's not the same thinking about the perfect algorithm and theory and clean algorithm that go into the real world, go into the experiment and trying to run it into the experiment. Many problems will appear. So first of all, the first problem is, of course, noise. We are dealing with noisy devices, so many of these of these qubits will not be perfect and the operations will not be perfect either. So there are many ways that we can try to compensate a little bit this noise. It's not quantum error correcting them, but still we can uh, compensate them a little bit. On one side, we can use uh, classical post-processing, which is running the circuits in a very different ways. And there are many methods like zero noise extrapolation or stabilized base approaches that can uh, guess what will be the good solution if we didn't have no if we don't have noise in the first place. So it's a kind of a uh, guessing, uh, but educated guess of what will happen if our quantum computer was perfect instead of noisy. And on the other side, we can also apply uh, quantum error, other kind of quantum error mitigation techniques like the quantum optimal control strategies. Each of these quantum gates in the end are some kind of physical operation, a, a, pol a laser pulse or a microwave pulse or something like that. So there are some uh, active ways to compensate errors that may appear during these operations. And there are, for instance, dynamical decoupling is one of the most used ones, and this is an active method. So you have to apply this during your circuit. Of course, that opens a new path in quantum optimal control, and how this is a purely or almost purely experimental part of the quantum computing. But if you are interested about the physics and how to build these devices, this is a good way to go. Then a, th a theory limitation that we have is the barren plateau problem, which means that this classical optimizer uh, could be very, very tricky because we have to start our quantum circuit with random parameters if we don't have any idea of how should we start. And because of that, we arrive to what is called a barren plateau. We can prove that the expectation value of the gradients is zero or tends to zero ex uh, exponentially and also the variance. So we cannot even use second order uh, optimization methods. And this is something that comes from theory that comes from um, because we are generated what is called a uni uh, to design. Uh, and it comes from the fact that the Hilbert space is so big that it's very easy to get trapped in a in a in a flat uh, in a flat place so you cannot move to any place. There are some ways, theoretical ways to solve this barren plateau problem. Some people are suggesting using parameters to the close to the solution so we are not lost in the in the space. We are starting close to it to the solution or use local cost functions instead of global ones, introduce correlation between parameters. Uh, it's a very, very active uh, field also inside NISC algorithms to find ways to mitigate or to reduce the barren plateau problem, which is a theory, is a theoretical uh, problem that arises 
because the, the Hilbert space is just too big. Another thing that we should uh, take into account is the expressibility of our circuits. If we are using what I mentioned before, uh, hardware, uh, hardware uh, inspired ansatz, which is these ansatz that I just prepare uh, whatever circuit that I know that I can prepare easily, and then I just hope that it will be enough to arrive to the solution. Well, the Hilbert space is enormous, so maybe I'm starting in very far away from the solution and my circuit is cannot lead me to the correct one. So my quantum circuit, even if I find the best parameters, it's really far away from my solution. So this is also called expressibility. So we can try to see to study which kind of ansatz are better than others and if they are expressible enough to move around the, the space. You can imagine that. Imagine that uh, we are in the in the surface of a sphere and we want to go from the North Pole to the South Pole. But for some reason, we can only move in the in the same latitude. Of course, we will never arrive to the South Pole. It's impossible because we are we can only move in one direction. So this is something this is what is happening here. But instead, in three dimensions, we are in two to the power of n dimensions. So it's much more complicated. And finally, the circuit copulation. So once I have my quantum circuit, I'm happy with it. Maybe I solved the Baron Plato problem. Maybe it's expressible enough and everything. I still have to run it in a real quantum computer. That means that I have to decompose my circuit into the basic gates. Not all gates are possible. Maybe I only have control node gate and the one from my circuit is another kind of gate. So I have to decompose them and then I also have to simplify the circuit and mapping it to the sorry to the qubit chip topology. So first of all, the decomposition, I can apply some mathematical tricks and identities, uh, Clifford circuits. There are even even there are some uh, some uh, libraries that help you with that. Same with simplification, I can use uh, tools like the Z ZX calculus, which is a graph representation of the circuits that allow us to simplify them, etc. And then I need to map them to the qubit topology. So you have my perfect ansatz, but then IBM computer, not all qubits are connected. Google computer, not all qubits are connected and the connectivity is different. That means that if I want to apply a two qubit gate, I can only apply it if the two qubits are connected. If they are not, I need to change my circuit somehow. So this is also a big pro um, a problem that we have to solve. There are some machine learning tools to solve it and also um, some classical tools that can help us with that. OK, let me check my time. Perfect. So let me um, finish this part with applications. There are many of them. In the end, people are, think, uh, are trying to think, what can we do when, with the device that we have? And many things arise. So it's basically applying variational, these variational circuits, adapting them to any possible application that you can think of. Uh, so I will just mention the, fa the famous ones or the ones that are more uh, more studied, but there are many more and more are, are coming every day on archive if you check every day. So the first of all is the variational quantum eigensolver, which was one of the first, uh, the one that opened the field, let's say, the, one of the first uh, suggestions. And the goal of a variational quantum eigensolver is to find the minimal um, the atomic separation that minimizes the energy of my molecule. So in the end, that means computing the expectation value of this Hamiltonian and checking as a function of this atomic separation, where is this minimum? So we have some ways to uh, map our electronic structure Hamiltonian, which describes how the electrons move around the molecule, to Pauli strings, which as, as I said before, these Pauli strings are the operators that we can measure in our quantum computer. So we can do this map. So we started with a exponentially big matrix, which is this Hamiltonian matrix, to adjust obtaining the expectation value of a polynomial number of terms, which are these Pauli strings. So that simplifies the problem at all, if we have a way to obtain these expectation values. A way to generate the circuit ansatz is using the unitary coupled cluster, which takes this Hamiltonian and decomposes uh, and use as the initial state the hartree fock which is the first approximation in classical approximation of this molecule and then use the unitary operation the cluster operator which is taking all these interactions between electrons and um, and uh, and expand them in a in a series that can be at the same time uh, mapped to a quantum to quantum gates so these are the excitations of hartree fock orbitals. The more excitations we have, the more precise will be our, our result, but also our quantum circuit will become more and more complicated. 
So the goal, as I said, is to minimize this uh, this um, this quantum circuit as a function of these parameters theta, uh, and find the minimal atomic separation. So as you can see in this plot, uh, each blue point is a uh, and each uh, gray point is one uh, one uh, variational quantum eigensolver. So you have to prepare the circuit, run it, find the optimal parameters, which give you the 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 ground the ground state energy. And they do a scan over all these parameters to find where is this minimum. This was implemented in a photonic device, by the way. Another super famous variational algorithm is the quantum approximate optimization algorithm. Uh, it can be understood as a trotter decomposition and adiabatic evolution. It's a mix of these two techniques. So here we have some mixing Hamil so our Hamiltonian, the one that we have to minimize as we did before with the VQE, is composed by a mixed Hamiltonian and a problem Hamiltonian. And this problem Hamiltonian encodes the problem, the, our optimization problem. So it normally encodes uh, what is called satisfiability uh, clauses. So this, there are some techniques that allows you to any optimization problem to map it into what is called three set problem or k-set problem, which means just you have a string of, of zeros and ones. And you have a, a series of logical operations like zero plus zero should be one, one plus one should be zero, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And because of that, if you find the mini, the the ground state of this Hamiltonian, it's equivalent to find the solution of, of your optimization problem. So here we have to construct the circuit ansat instead of using the unitary couple cluster as before. Here the idea is to repeat the mixing Hamiltonian with the problem Hamiltonian in an alternate way. So because of that, we have this object, uh, objective function that depends on these parameters beta and gamma, and the goal is the same. Minimize this objective function uh, with our quantum computer by computing the expectation value of our problem Hamiltonian. Sorry, I think I have some noise. Uh, give me a second that I will try to find some headphones. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. We can hear you. Thank you. Sorry for that. OK, finally, we have uh, machine learning applications. And here I would like to distinguish between uh, um, classical and quantum machine learning, because sometimes could be confusing. So there are two, two, uh, two dimensions that we have to look at. Uh, one is the algorithm, if the algorithm is classical or is quantum. And the other is the data, the data that we use if it's quantum or if it's classical. So what I understood as a quantum machine learning is all if when we use quantum algorithms that uh, are fit with classical or quantum data. But uh, for instance, you can also hear about machine learning applied to quantum, which are classical methods, so standard machine learning, but you are trying to learn something that comes from quantum theory. So this is still classical, but also involves and uses quantum physics somehow because you are trying to learn something from quantum physics. But in my case, what I will discuss now are quantum machine learning, which means that the algorithm is quantum, is a quantum algorithm. And as uh, as any machine learning uh, method, we can divide it into supervised learning, unsupervised or reinforcement learning. I will just mention supervised learning. So let me try to uh, generalize the idea of a neural network to uh, to the quantum regime. So a classical neural network starts with some input neurons where the data is fit, and then this data is processed with hidden neurons. And uh, finally, we, uh, we use the output neurons to construct the, the optimization function that we need to optimize and find the optimal parameters in each of these neurons. Similarly, in quantum, uh, we have the circuit-centric classifier, uh, sorry, uh, neural networks, let's say, which we also have some gates that encode uh, our data into our quantum circuit. Then we have some processing layers which process the data. And then we, of course, we have to measure. And with this measure, we can construct a cost function that we can use to optimize the parameters of the encoding and processing parts. Uh, in more detail, that means that we first need to find a set of quantum gates, a variational circuit in the end, a parameterized circuit that encodes the data. So here we will have the parameters to be optimized, but also the data points, which cannot be optimized, are fixed. 
then we will have some processing layers, which in the end, what are they doing is to rotate the, the state to the correct basis so we can measure the correct one. And finally, with this measure, you, we can construct a fidelity cost function or any other kind of cost function that we can put into our classical optimizer in order to find these parameters in a similar way that we use in neural networks that we want to find the biases and weights of these neurons. Uh, we can also construct a kernel and use kernel methods, like classical kernel methods, but this time to obtain this kernel, we use the overlap between different states of different data. In this diagrammatic representation, maybe it's clear that we are in the quantum Hilbert space, which is enormous, and you, we have some input space of our data, and we need to find a way to codify this data into our Hilbert space, and then we need to access to it by measuring the different states there and sampling. And let me just close with a recent work that we developed in, in my group, which is the quantum machine learning applied to many body ground state physics. So it's a mixture between the variational quantum eigen solver and what I just mentioned about quantum machine learning. So the goal is to find the circuit that learns what is this, uh, this uh, profile of our energy. So instead of having to repeat the, the, the minimization over and over of our BQE, as happened in the example that I showed before, we just uh, run a series of test points and then we learn the profile with our quantum circuit. So it's a mixture between the variational quantum eigen solver and the, this quantum neural network application. So let me close my talk with this NISC horizon, what's yet to come. First of all, what is the road? As I said, we have the theory. Uh, we need to understand better what the complexity theory, what are the what are the these problems that can be solved with a quantum computer, but they can't be solved with a classical computer. We need new algorithms. We have these variational algorithms. We have other kinds of algorithms, but still there are not so many. And what are the theoretical limits? Because maybe we just discovered that uh, if there is too much noise, we have very cl clever met classical methods to to simulate everything. And something that maybe you have read is uh, even with these uh, quantum advantage claims by Google and the group of Zhang Wenpang, uh, there are some people that are just classical people, so people that work in classical computation that are just improving the classical methods to simulate quantum physics in a way that they are you know, closing the gap between these quantum advantage exper in these quantum advantage experiments. So in the end, it's a kind of competition between quantum computer scientists that are trying to find new applications that cannot be simulated with a classical computer and classical computing scientists that are trying to improve their methods so they can uh, still tell to the quantum ones, hey, we can solve this uh, with a classical computer. We don't need a quantum computer for that. So there is this kind of tension, which is very interesting because new classical methods and techniques are being developed thanks to this kind of competition and race. Then we have the experiment. Which technology is better? Should we use superconducting circuits? Should we use uh, trapped ions? Should we use photons? Is it scalable? So we can have uh, 50 qubits, but it's as easy to have 50 than having 1 million, or maybe we don't have a space. We need too much lab space. Which quantum controls techniques uh, do we have to really design these quantum gates and reduce the error of these gates, reduce the coherence and crosstalk, etc.? And between all of this, we have to develop software tools. Uh, we need to program these quantum algorithms. And a quantum computer, in the end, the hardware is quantum, but the control is classical. We need we use a classical computer to uh, design our experiment, and we send it to the machine. The machine runs it and return us some, some beta string that we need to post-process. So we need software tools anyway to uh, connect this quantum experiment with the classical one. We need benchmark measures. We need to know uh, if this quantum computer is better than this one or not, especially if we are comparing different technologies. Not all the technologies are equal, so which quantum computer is better? The one developed at Google or the one developed at IBM, for instance? So we need to benchmark and see what are the limitations of these devices. We also need, of course, practical applications. Maybe you are a, you are a basic, basic sci scientist, so you don't care about direct applications. They will come in the future, maybe, and you care about the physics and developing the experiment. But then there are many other people that they care about applications and they want to find if these quantum computers can be useful, not in the future, but right now. And of course, especially all the companies and the industry, they want to, to see applications at short term, obviously. And then, 
around all of these quantum technologies, not only computation, but also the others that I mentioned, quantum communication, sensing, metrology, etc. There is enabling the huge enabling technology field. We need someone that builds, for instance, the dilution refrigerators needed for cooling down the superconducting circuits. We need people that build the devices, the lasers, etc., that are useful for the experiment. So we need a huge technological effort that comes from different fields, not only from quantum. It comes from a, from a electrical engineers. It comes from the new material scientists, etc. And talking about the software, let me mention how to program a quantum algorithm. Uh, this is a big graph. I, I will not go into detail on it. I, I can go it later if you, if you wish. But the point is each company and its research group are developing their own uh, quantum language. So that means we have many. We have Qiskit from ABM, we have Cirque for Google, Penny Lane from Xanadu, PyQuil for, for Rigetti, Kibo for Kilimanjaro, and not only that, we also use uh, libraries that help us to, to use applications. For instance, Open Fermion and MSI4 are libraries used to map the electronic structure Hamiltonians of chemistry to the Pauli strings that we need for our quantum computer. So we, we have many different libraries and it's kind of a mess because if you want to program something uh, and run it in different devices, then you need to translate these devices. So maybe your code is super uh, is well programmed in Qiskit, but then you want to test it in uh, in the Google in the Google machine. So you need to translate it to Circ. So it's like instead of only programming in C++, you have to program in C++, Fortran, Python, etc. So because of that, some people like us in our group, we are developing. A, we just develop a, a new language which is called Tequila. And it's open source, of course, so anyone can contribute, anyone can play with it. And the idea of Tequila is you only have to program it once. And uh, you just select in one line of code, OK, run this, translate this circuit to Qiskit or translate it to uh, Circ or any language. So you don't have to care about translating anything. You just program everything once and then you can send it to any device without having to, to, to know how is the syntax and everything. And we are happy to hear from contributions. So if you are interested on that, let me know and I can give you all the all the information and you can just contribute. The idea is to create this language for everybody, especially everybody in academia or not, or everybody that wants to learn and that's it. So uh, so it's totally open source and, uh, and, and yeah, it can be used from ev for everyone. And finally, what is the next goal? The next goal is fault tolerant quantum computing. So next goal is having enough qubits so we can com we can use quantum error correction, which as I said at the very beginning is to protect the quantum information in a highly entangled state. So that means that we need many qubits to uh, to really have one perfect qubit that we that we said that is a logical qubit. So this has a lot of a big qubit overhead. We need thousands of millions of qubits to implement a full tolerant quantum algorithm. Uh, that's why we have this NISC uh, in the end. And uh, it's uh, something that we also need to study if it's no if the noise limits the NISC algorithm as a big way. So maybe if we have too much noise, as I said also before, we can use classical techniques that can also uh, approximate the solution. So it's not clear what are the advantages of NIST, but in any case, it's a very exciting uh, field. Many things have to be explored. That's why it's so exciting, because there are many things that we don't know, and that's the best that could happen to a scientist. So uh, not only that, but we have to, uh, to collaborate between people from different fields. Uh, I'm a physicist, but I need to work with, uh, with uh, computer scientists so they can tell me, yeah, this problem is easy for a classical computer, so don't look at it uh, with a quantum one, you will lose your time. I also have to work with software engineers that help me to program the tools to run my algorithms. I also need to talk with, uh, with engineers that are building these devices so I can ask them, is my algorithm something that has sense or maybe not, maybe it's impossible to implement experimentally. And I also need to uh, to talk with people from different backgrounds because I'm looking for applications. So I have this tool, which is called quantum computing, uh, but I don't know which problem I should try to solve. Could you tell me what is the problem in your field? And that's why, for instance, many people are working in, in finance problems. So people from finance said we have these super complicated problems. Maybe we can try to explore if they can be solved with a quantum computer. And this is very nice because you are learning. You can learn a lot uh, about other fields and there is a lot of, of uh, talking. 
So thank you very much for your attention. These uh, all people that was involved in this uh, noise intermediate scale quantum algorithms review, and people from my group and people from also Long Chu Quack uh, group at Singapore. So I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you. You're most welcome. Thank you so much for your talk and, and your detailed uh, explanations for everything. Uh, I believe that we have uh, some questions uh, starting from uh, the registration form itself. So uh, the first one I believe that you have already answered, which is uh, what are some practical applications of variational quantum circuits? So uh, would you like to say something more about this or, uh, or, uh, or it's enough? Yeah, as I said, uh, it's, it's equivalent to say um, what are the applications of having a computer, a laptop, let's say. So it's anything that you can think of somehow, but you need to think the algorithms that do that. So that's the non-trivial part of it, of course. So in the end, these are the applications that we came out, uh, the ones that people are studying at some point. So many body physics, of course, so all quantum simulation is included, machine learning, combinatorial optimization, also numerical solvers, finance and then we also have even in other fields like even in in nuclear physics so people are trying to simulate nuclear physics with a quantum computer and and many more so in the end is if you have some problem that you are wondering can we use a quantum computer to solve it maybe it has sense to at least think about it maybe you just discovered that uh, there are already very clever uh, classical methods, so maybe you don't need a quantum computer for that. So that's the other thing. Uh, we don't need a quantum computer for everything. It's in the same way that we don't need a, a supercomputer for checking our emails. It's We don't need that. Uh, we need a quantum computer to solve those problems that with a classical computer are not efficient or require a lot of energy or time. And that's the non-trivial part. What are these problems? In some cases we know, and in other cases, we are just wondering maybe this one, but it's not guaranteed. Maybe some super clever classical scientist finds uh, a good uh, application uh, that is classical and not quantum. So in general for any applications, as, uh, as I said. Okay, perfect, perfect. Uh, the second question is more about your, uh, your major itself and your, uh, your activities. So uh, can, can you tell us more about your, your own measure starting from bachelor up until your postdoc right now? So this field is kind of new. It, uh, I mean, it started in the 80s or so, but the real hype is now. So I started, I studied physics and I was the first generation of my of physics in the University of Barcelona that uh, that we study one small subject about quantum information. So that includes computing and includes other things. And we were only seven people in class. Now there are more than 60 people, of course, they want to take these classes. So because of that, when I finished my degree, uh, there was no master in Barcelona or close to Barcelona uh, in quantum technologies. And it was something interesting for me because my former supervisor of my, of my thesis, uh, bachelor thesis, was working on that. But I decided to do a master in uh, in particle physics. So not not related at all, but I liked particle physics. So I just wanted to study that. And when I finished my master, I talked again with that supervisor and I told him that I wanted to do a PhD. And, and he suggested to study a particle physics process, but for a quantum information point of view. So kind of mixing the two fields. And during my PhD, uh, a new group was founded in the Barcelona Supercomputing Center. And this group, uh, the goal of this group was applying, uh, studying quantum computation. So that's why at the end of my PhD, I started to work actively in quantum computing because that was the requirement in the end. And because of that, I just decided to continue in quantum computing. And now I'm doing my, my postdoc at Alana Spuruguzi Group at University of Toronto. And in my group, we study basically uh, this NISC algorithm. So which kind of things can we do with a near-term quantum computer? We also develop the software tool and we also study benchmark methods. So my my career is kind of weird in the sense that I study physics. Uh, sorry, I st studied particle physics and I ended up uh, working in quantum computation. But now things are very different. So because now there are masters in quantum in quantum technologies, uh, more people care about this field. So there is more money, let's say, for PhDs in in this field. Uh, you also have the opportunity to go to the industry, which is something that didn't exist before, of course. 
So uh, I cannot really, I feel that I cannot really tell what to do to anyone in a sense that I, I'm from a different, you know, ebook, uh, different years where things were totally different in this sense. So now the 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 panorama is completely different. Okay, thank you. Uh, another question. Uh, first, th there is a huge, a huge statement, and then uh, the question itself. Uh, the statement is. It seems for me, uh, NESC was launched only to impress the industry with quantum computing potential, but in fact, there are no well-known applications for it, surpassing classical computers. So uh, here is the question. How far do you agree with that and why? Um, with, I mean, it's obvious that this field has a lot of hype. So there you can read many claims that are not true at all. Uh, but these claims, not all of them came from NISC. They some, sometimes they came from these fault tolerant algorithms, like the short factorization algorithm. Like, yeah, we will break encryption and these kind of things. Well, we will probably break encryption in 30 years, even more, even if it's possible, because we need millions of qubits for that. And, and for them, we will change completely all, all the encryption protocols. So that's not true directly. And with NISC, uh, it has started much before because, look, the the this paper the bqe which was one of the first papers in variational quantum algorithms that opened the nisc uh, it's from 2014 so ibm started to build their computers in this year but basically and they were not sure how to do it at all so this paper also comes not from industry but from uh, uh, harvard so an mit so they are researchers they were really thinking about how can we solve these chemistry problems and they came out with this idea with using a quantum computer for that and quantum computation, especially for quantum simulation, it came from the 80s. So it's much before there were companies at all interested on this on these things. So that is true that you can read many claims that are um, hyped and things that are not completely true or sometimes directly not true. Like, yeah, we can use a quantum computer to solve COVID situation. Of course, that's not true. Uh, but uh, at the same time, there are many things that can be done and they are very interesting for a purely physical point of view. Only the race of building these devices and understanding why they work or why they don't work. For instance, we now know that uh, superconducting circuits using quantum computation, uh, one of the sources of errors come from uh, cosmic backgrounds, from cosmic rays. So cosmic rays that arrive to Earth because these devices are not completely isolated, they are so precise that they can affect the state of the qubits. So people are now designing ways to uh, detect these cosmic rays using these quantum computers, not for quantum computation, but because we build these computers and these computers are not perfect. They are uh, they they are um, they can be affected by noise coming from cosmic rays. So these kind of questions are very interesting, and that's why uh, NISC is just a name but it includes many potential applications. In some cases, some applications like QAOA algorithm, for instance, is guaranteed that it can lead to, um, to solve some problems that cannot be solved efficiently with a classical computer. But at the same time, as I said before, this is a kind of race and competition between classical and quantum. It, I will be more than happy to discover uh, new classical algorithms that can solve these problems. So that's good. So that's why, because people in quantum were trying to solve these problems, people in classical are trying to beat us, and that's perfect because b both of us we uh, we are boosting the these uh, computational techniques and solving more problems with that. And uh, uh, just a last, a last example, uh, it was discovered recently what is called the quantization algorithms, which are classical algorithms to solve problems that that uh, more efficiently than the previous computational methods. And they were found because people that developed them, they uh, took the inspiration of the quantum uh, way of solving these problems and translated to the classical. So because they knew that you can solve it with a quantum computer efficiently, they say, OK, let's try to get the inspiration from it and extract a completely classical algorithm. So because someone did that in quantum in the first place, these people were able to find the classical algorithm that do the same. Uh, so this is uh, truly amazing, at least from my point of view. So there are many things that you can try and to dream of in this case, not only hype uh, and uh, and general, you know, uh, press releases. OK, thank you. Uh, I believe that uh, there are a few questions uh, in the chat. Uh, let's start with the first one. 
uh, it says, is, is there any provable advantage of hybrid quantum variational algorithms with respect to plain classical variational algorithms? For instance, classical neural network based variational wave functions. Um, yes and no. So let me explain. So the problem with the classical methods is uh, they are, ex of co they, um, by the way, first of all, uh, quantum variational quantum algorithms are not uh, the same level of the state of the art of classical method. That means that all our problems, uh, since we have to, uh, to either run it in a quantum computer that is small because it's only 10 qubits, 20 qubits, and or because we have to simulate their effects. So that means that we use a classical computer to simulate it. So that's limit as our computational uh, um, required resources. Uh, that means that uh, all the uh, all the molecules that we simulate, for instance, this one are by far simulated with these classical methods. So these are this is not the state of the art in chemistry at all. We are far away from the state of the art. The point of these methods is in chemistry, in, in, in these classical methods, the, you know that at some point you will not be able to, uh, to compute higher order terms because that will require too much computational expenses. Not only that, even if you can compute higher order terms and, uh, and approximations that, that are much more precise, you will probably need a lot of energy in computational resources, for instance, in a supercomputer. So this is a lot of energy cost. These methods, the idea of these methods is trying to, first of all, do the same as classical ones, but using much less uh, computational resources. For instance, by using this quantum computer, which is uh, energetically much more, uh, much less expensive. So for, in, for giving an example, a, a supercomputing, a super, sorry, superconducting quantum computer, uh, you need to cool down. So you need a dilution refrigerator that cool down the chips to uh, almost zero Kelvin. Once you are down, uh, keeping the temperature is not ex energetically costly. Of course, it costs some energy, but it's not comparable with uh, keeping uh, cold uh, a supercomputer, which will require a lot of an amount of energy. So only because of that, this is a potential advantage, which is not proof, but a potential advantage of these quantum algorithms. And on the other side, uh, the problem with quantum physics, in the end, at some point, you are using some kind of approximation because this is the only way that you can compute that classically. So if you need to be extremely precise with some uh, of these simulations, you know that at some point you will not be able to do that or you will need a supercomputing running during months to obtain, which is what is people doing right now, to obtain this solution. So that's why these people try, were trying to uh, think, can we use a quantum computer, which is also quantum, to, to take advantage of these properties and, and, and eventually once we have 100 qubits or more qubits, we can simulate molecules much better than with a classical computer. It's not proof because we don't have enough qubits yet to prove it. So that's we are still developing the technology. But it's one of the potential advantages that people believe that it will work. Maybe we are wrong, but we cannot know yet. We are exploring that right now. OK, thank you. Thank you. Uh, another question, which uh... I think it's uh, a little bit not related to uh, to the talk, but um, here it is. Uh, what are the advantages and disadvantages of, for example, uh, uh, superconducting qubits and optical qubits, or for example, quantum modes? That is the first part. The second part is how many qubits do do different companies predict, so for example, like in, uh, in the near or the far future, and uh, finally. Um, is it possible to share the slides? I, uh, oh, yeah, yeah, I will share the slides, no problem. So I always put my slides in my web page, and of course I will send it to you later, uh, so you can uh, oh, that uh, is so it for everyone. Thank you. No, of course, no problem. Uh, okay, regarding the first question, um, superconducting circuits, uh, some of the pros. Uh, they are ex so you need to build a chip which is more or less this size so it's not super big once you have the chip you can have many qubits in this chip you put these qubits into your refri uh, dilution refrigerator call it down and you can control it easily from the easily from the outside and and you can initialize the the qubits very quickly that means you run your quantum your algorithm you measure the qubits you need to repeat the algorithm again that means you need to put the qubits in the zero state again and repeat the process. And this is very fast. See, this is extremely fast. Then the one problem that it has, 
the 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 coherence times of these qubits is uh, really it's very short it's mi microseconds that means that you need to run the circuit very fast but the gates to implement these gates is also super fast so its gate takes nanoseconds so in the end you need to to know how many so how much time do you have to implement your algorithm before the qubits lose uh, the qubit lose the coherence but uh, how many gates can you apply because then you have ions, uh, trapped ions. The coherence times are much bigger. They are even minutes, I think, uh, some of the records, but at least seconds for sure. But the gate implementation takes much longer. So its gate takes uh, maybe microseconds or milliseconds. So in the end, this rate between how many gates can you implement in a certain amount of time is similar as with superconducting circuits. Uh, at the same time, I'm not an expert, of course, in, uh, in the experiments, so I'm not aware if people are imp improving these things, so don't take my word for that. Uh, but, uh, but this is one of the pros and cons of both technologies. And then you have photons. Photons are, are really good for quantum communication, for instance, because it's the only technology that we know by now that we can transmit this quantum information. But on the other side, uh, photon experiments, uh, con uh, Having this entanglement between different modes is extremely complicated. Uh, that means that that limits a lot the, which kind of algorithms can you run at the moment. And then the, you need to detect the photons uh, you need, and you need uh, single photon detectors. And these single photon detectors, although the efficiency, uh, the efficiency is very high nowadays, it requires time. So you need in the end to send very high energy pulse, laser pulses to detect these photons. That means, and I will show you, so probably next week we will publish a paper about it, uh, comparing the photons, some experiment with photons and with superconducting circuits. The experiment uh, took uh, 30,000 times much time that with a superconducting circuit. So we run the experiment in, millise in, in seconds with, uh, with the superconducting circuit device, uh, but with the same photonic experiment took um, weeks of uh, taking data to uh, to reconstruct the experiment. So that's a pro and a con of a photon. You can control it uh, very well and you can even work with higher dimensional uh, states. But on the other side, uh, the, 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 the gate count, for instance, and the photon count is one of the disadvantages. So in the end, all of them has pros and cons. And that's why it's not clear which is the technology that will deliver the final quantum computer. Maybe probably it's just a mix of many of them. So we, we don't know, and people are working in others, so it's uh, it's not clear. Uh, the second part of the question, sorry, was? I couldn't remember. Um, uh, okay, uh, how, how many qubits do different companies predict? Oh. I, mean? Uh, I mean, predicting and actually having it is very different, especially if we talk about the industry. Of course, everybody wants to say that they will build a one million quantum computer, but we have to see it. At the moment, uh, companies like IBM, they have up to 65 qubits, if I'm not mistaken, and they have many chips of less qubits. Some of them you can be used in the cloud, so it's very nice because you can use it for free and to, just to run some uh, small experiments. Then you have Google that has 72 qubits, sorry, they built 72 qubit device, but in the end, uh, the one from Quantum Advantage was 53. And, and then both companies are planning 1 million qubits. But of course, I don't know if it's something that they can do or it's just a big claim. Uh, I hope that they can because, of course, they have huge uh, scientific teams that are very awesome. So I don't doubt that they will do it eventually, but who knows when. And then you have uh, Ion Q, which they are working with ions. I think they have 125 ions. Uh, the problem with ions or with uh, not only with ions, with everybody is you can have 65 qubits, uh, 125 ions. You can have many things. The question is, are all these qubits connected? What are the gate counts, uh, the gate errors of these qubits? Uh, what are the, the coherence times of these qubits? So I can build you know, a, a chip with 1,000 qubits or 1,000 of Joseph Jung junctions in the superconducting circuits and still have zero control on them, so we cannot use it for anything. So it's not only the number, it's the quality of the qubits. If they can be used for, for you know, running uh, um, algorithms like, like the one, like the BQE or any other. So not all, even if the, you, you claim that you have 100 qubits, that doesn't mean that you control these qubits well enough. So maybe it's just, yeah, I make the effort to build this device, but maybe you don't control it. So 
careful with these big, big claims. Uh, at the same time, there are a lot. So there, there is also Psy Quantum, which is a company that works with photons. They are being very mysterious lately, but uh, they are starting to publish some results or how and they, I think they, they have many uh, photonic you know, qubits in this case. And uh, the good thing in the industry is, even though there can be some claims that are exaggerated or we don't know directly, uh, the teams are real scientists. So that's that's why we trust that uh, they can really do that because the scientists that are involved in the project uh, come from academia and they have shown during many years that they can build this kind of devices. So, so yeah, at the moment, yeah, we are talking about 100 qubits as much. And of course, everybody's trying to build a plan to to have 1,000 qubits, 2,000 qubits, etc. Because the goal, as I said, is quantum error correction in the end. And for that, you need many qubits. Okay, thank you. Uh, I think uh, the last two questions from the chat. Uh, the first one, uh, are, are there any books you can recommend for quantum computing and quantum information? For example, uh, uh, there are old books like from 2000s and uh, we we have some some new books in in 2020 so uh what is your recommendation so yeah i mean the book i guess that you're thinking about the uh, uh, quantum computation and quantum information by nielsen mm -hmm. and Chuang. <laughs> yeah i study with that book and although this book doesn't contain the state of the art obviously because it's from 2000s it's an extremely good book so please read it everybody should read it everybody should study it because there are many things so because this field uh, experienced this huge, uh, huge expansion, and many, many people are starting uh, working on it. Some of them are not aware, and I include myself, that many good results are known since the 90s. So you do all your effort to do your algorithm, and some guy from the 90s already did that before. So that's why these kind of old books in quantum information are so important. Uh, for instance, not everybody knows that if you use uh, particular set of gates, or if you don't generate uh, enough entanglement, everything can be simulated classically. So there are many classical methods that can can do that. Or the or or or, or theorems like the Holevo bond that tell you that you can you, even if you can process an exponential amount of of information with quantum computer with a quantum device, that doesn't mean that you have access to this exponential amount of information. You only have access to a, a a polynomial a logarithm amount of information. So uh, there are many important things in these books that I highly recommend, and they are very well written. For uh, state of the art, I recommend the Kiski textbook. It's very nice. They also they are also in, uh, including things uh, the experimental uh, things on how these devices work. So it's it's super useful. I also recommend their tutorials in quantum algorithms. They are also very good. Uh, then you also have Penny Lane which is the language developed by the company Shanadu. And they also have many uh, demos and tutorials that especially in quantum machine learning, and it's very useful. And uh, yeah, I think that's that's the, at least the resources that I have checked personally, but there are many more. So I think that you can basically trust anything that you look at Google in this direction, because the community is very big and people are doing uh, very nice uh, tutorials in different branches of, of applications of quantum computation. So and there, there are very new new books too, but I didn't check them, so I, I cannot say. OK, um, another one. Uh, what is the difference between quantum computing, quantum simulation and, and quantum information? So quantum information is the 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 theoretical framework, let's say, when everything is on top of it. So once you have, I mean, actually the the bottom part of it is quantum mechanics and information theory, mm -hmm. and both combine uh, deliver quantum information. Then we have the applications, the technologies, and the technologies we have quantum computation. Then we have quantum uh, simulation. Quantum simulation can be also include inside of quantum computing because it's simulating a, a a system, and you can do that with a programmable device like a quantum computer. But because we don't have this super uh, universal quantum computer yet, because we only have uh, small prototypes, uh, what people are doing is constructing quantum simulators, which are physical systems that you can try to program, but not fully program. So you cannot solve any problem with its only particular problems. 
in a way that they simulate other system that you want to learn some information from it. So what is used, for instance, are um, Bose-Einstein condensates. So you can use a Bose-Einstein condensate and program the interaction between the, the different bosons. So you can simulate spin systems and you can simulate condensed matter models and study phase transitions, etc. And these are this is the field of quantum simulation. Then we have quantum communication that includes quantum cryptography or quantum key distribution, which is transmitting quantum information between different people. So how to uh, encode uh, and transmit information in a different way that is also secure because we are using some cryptographic protocol. And then, uh, and then we have quantum metrology and quantum sensing, which is constructing sensors that are extremely precise. So one example is, for instance, using a qubit to detect these, uh, these, uh, these cosmic rays, or uh, using qubits to detect, um, to measure the, the magnetic field of Earth or something like that with extreme precision because they are individual quantum systems, so they are extremely precise. So anything that happens to them will be very obvious. So that's why it's, it's used for, for this uh, higher precision test and higher precision measurements. This is metrology and sensing. OK, perfect. Uh, the last question here. Uh, are there any courses, uh, uh, courses or conferences on quantum algorithms that you uh, can recommend? Well, conferences, um, it depends on your background. So if you if you are just starting in this field, I will not recommend to go to any conference because you probably will not understand. You need the, to study first the field and have some some uh, some basic ideas about how it works so you can follow the talks. Something that is really cool is uh, what companies are doing, or not only companies, also some groups, uh, which are the quantum hackathons. So quantum hackathons are open for everyone, not necessarily with a with a quantum computing background. And uh, the idea is they provide a set of uh, of small talks that are um, for different researchers, but for a broad audience, not from people from the field. And then they, you have to solve some quantum problems. So you have like one day or two to, uh, in a group to solve some quantum problem. And that's really useful because you learn a lot of these hackathons. So this is very nice because they provide good material and they always invite nice and nice researchers to give very general talks. So it's a good way maybe to initialize in this field besides taking classes or reading about it. It's also attending to these hackathons because it's it's uh, they are designed for encouraging people to uh, to join this field in the first place. So yeah, I would recommend something like that if you don't have any background in quantum computation. Well, perfect, perfect. Uh, thank you so much. I, I think uh, I think that's it. There are no more questions. Uh, uh, I do have only one thing that uh, I would like to share with you. Uh, I uh, I read your paper, Universal Cubic Classifier, mm -hmm. like I think two years ago. That that was like the first uh, algorithm that I have implemented myself. Uh, using wow. a pure, pure casket, yeah, and I, I even implemented it uh, using Colab. Uh, the most, the most beautiful thing about it is that uh, it made me able to, or it enabled me to embed a lot of features because I was, uh, I was trying to tackle uh, an NLP problem, and the embedding vector was a bit huge. So. Uh, typically, it's like 128 or uh, 64 features. So, I made a huge reduction and then something called uh, word to vector uh, algorithm so that I can produce like for example uh, maximum 12 features or nine features and I then you know repeated the uh, the encoding feature uh, mechanism and in, in, in your algorithm and the results were very promising uh, actually um, in, in some situations they even uh, uh, exceeded the uh, the SVM uh, or the kernelized version of, of SVM. So uh, th that was my first encounter with the. <laughs> with okay. very, I'm very so happy things. to hear that. Yeah, yeah. I yeah. mean, that's why you will release the code in the end, and that's why I think there's this open community in quantum. So everybody is sharing their codes and sharing mm -hmm. the results, so other people can take it and improve it. You know, yes, and learn yeah. from it, of course, but also improve it. So that's that's very nice. Okay, I think that uh, Professor Yunus would like to say something. Uh, I will mute. Uh, Dr. Alba, thank you very much for this really beautiful talk. Uh, it was really useful. Uh, uh, 
Actually, I have a list of questions, but uh, I know you, you had already many questions today, so I will limit my questions only to two. Um, actually, uh, NISC era or, or NISC algorithms, uh, when it appears, we, we, we were really uh, not happy about it because all these errors and all this noise. Mm -hmm. uh, but it turns out it to be useful. Uh, for example, we, we debunked variational circuits or something like that. So do you think we, we want now to get rid uh, uh, of uh, this NISC era or we are using it in, in a very good way? So uh, I'm particularly I'm happy that NISC era is not perfect because when things are not perfect is when you can you have a space to improve them somehow. If everything is perfect, then it's boring. You cannot do anything. And as example, the last... Uh, the last results of yesterday of the moment of Muon, etc. When theory doesn't agree with experiment, is where the things become interesting. So, so yeah, in this sense of uh, applications and so it's. Uh, I personally think that there are many things to try, and that's why it's so interesting to work in the in this field. And. Uh, so I, I mean, yeah. uh, are we trying to get rid of the noise or we are trying to use the noise? It's a mix. Yeah. yeah, that's what I'm trying to think. Yeah, it's a mixture. It depends on who you ask. So for instance, experimentalists, of course, they are trying to get rid of it. <laughs> but then theoreticians, in the meantime, while the experimentalists do their job, we are trying to see, OK, we have the noise. Maybe we can use it for something for learning about physics or to take advantage of it, for instance, with these variational algorithms. So it depends on who you ask. You can try to use the noise in your favor. And but of course, at the same time, you don't want this noise because you want to discover new things. And probably for that, you need uh, you need a perfect quantum computer. So it depends on who you ask. Perfect answer. Uh, OK, um, actually, I'm really interested about this tequila uh, programming. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I checked it quickly. So uh, can I run uh, code uh, directly on tequila or do I have to import it to one of the uh, existing libraries first. So it is kind of simulation, local execution. First, you will need to write it in tequila language. So yeah, you, if you already have your pro, your code in another language, you have to translate it to tequila, which is the general framework. But once it's in tequila, you don't need to worry about it uh, about it any, anymore. So you can just so you write your code and then you use backend equal Qiskit, backend equal Cirque. And it automatically is translated to that, so you don't have to care about new things. So everything will be done in the background by Tequila developers, let's say. So, uh, so are you are you ready to to give us a, a workshop uh, on on Tequila to to Alexandria Quantum Computing Group soon? Because uh, it is really interesting. The the concept of high level programming language on quantum computing is uh, really because writing all these codes on different platforms and using different libraries is really so I'm um, really interesting project. So uh, congratulations for this project. OK, thank you. Uh, yeah, I mean, I'm not sure if I will have I will can I can do that in the next uh, days or even month. Uh, and I'm also I'm developer of Tequila, but all the applications, tutorials, beta testing, etc. But not the bottom part of it. So, so the background part of it. So the developer part was done by the first authors, Jacob and Sumner. But I can suggest maybe I can talk with them so we can try to me to do a workshop, a small workshop about it. And and yeah, or probably you can invite them to give this talk because they will probably do it much better than me in this case because they know all the subtleties of the code. So in case that in case that you have questions about some in particular implementations, they know all these things. So I can pass you the yeah the their contact, and I'm I'm sure that they will find a date for doing that. Thank you, thank you very much. We will do this. Thank you. Okay, thank you, everyone. Uh, I think uh, this concludes the meeting. Uh, I will stop recording right now. And uh, thank you, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Alpa, for your uh, presentation. And happy to be.